Welcome back to Icons, and joining me today, he is a multi-talented entertainer. He's an actor, he is a stand-up comedian, he's a voice actor. If you are an 80s or 90s baby, you grew up with this man. He was on X-Files, he was on Outer Limits, he was on Stargate, he was even on Happy Gilmore. Most recently, he was on My Little Pony, Action Dad, and of course, of course... We gotta bring up, he was Rolf and Ed, Ed, and Eddie, and before Sean Schemmel, he was the voice of adult Goku in Dragon Ball Z. I am extremely honored to welcome Mr. Peter Kalamis. Hello. Hello, how are you today? I'm good, how are you, sir? I'm doing great. Yes, I'm so, it's such a pleasure to talk to you because getting an interview with you is, um, it's rare, like I don't see too many of them out there and I, I, there's so much, there's so many questions I have for you because, you know, you're, I'm fascinated by your career because you've done so many different things like on stage and then behind a microphone that seem to be like the opposite, but you've been good at all of them. Well, no, thank you very much. I mean, I, I started in, in stand-up. Uh, and I was always fascinated by comedy and watching comedy. And, and I mean, I grew up watching literally the Carol, as I'm aging myself here, literally the Carol Burnett show. When I was a kid, I used to watch it and laugh my ass off and the Dean Martin roasts. And and then when I started getting old enough to be able to, to appear at clubs and, and uh, stand up venues and things like that, uh, you know, I saw the rise of, you know, Ellen DeGeneres, uh, Jay Leno, Jerry Seinfeld, all these all these people. And I, I've always loved comedy. And that kind of steered me into uh, probably voices primarily because I do a lot of characters in my stand up show. And they kind of parlayed into, you know, doing some voice commercials and then landing some auditions and and there and, and, and off it went from there. I'm fascinated by stand-up com comedy, and I'll tell you why, because I, I was actually going to start with that. I'm glad you brought it up, because as a kid like me, people told me that I should have done stand-up, and it's not that I have stage fright. It's more so like you have to keep coming up with new jokes, because I feel like, like I imagine if you have like a gig that's like televised, you know, uh, on HBO or Comedy Central or whatever, you can't reuse the same jokes, so you have to keep coming up with jokes over and over again. And I feel like that's a tremendous amount of pressure uh, to do that. And am I even on the right stratosphere with that? Yeah, you are. Once you've um, used material on a televised kind of format, you you kind of burn burn through that material as far as another televised show, pr pr pretty much. And the scary part is that when you're up there, I mean, I've never been up there, but I, I assume if you if you say a joke, this is just my fears coming out, and the joke doesn't hit, it's like uncomfortable. Like you're like, oh. What did I do? You know, like, like, is there a trick to getting around that? I, I think the more you've done it and the longer you've done it, you tend to uh, get a better barometer for what's going to be funny, especially, if, you know, for yourself. My rule has always been, I mean, I will do a joke if uh, I think it will make me laugh. And then hopefully everybody else is along for the ride. <laughs> Sometimes that's not the case. Uh, you know, I've done these massive bits that have all these energy all this energy and screaming and all this stuff and i'm down on my knees top of my lungs and one joke in particular i remember and there was dead silence oh man how, how did, did that like affect you like you were like what the hell it sucks it sucks <laughs> doing a set that doesn't go well it really sucks and um i think any comic who really cares about what they do it, it, you talk them after they have a good show and they're on top of the world but they could have a hundred good shows it's kind of like golf you can play a round of golf and, uh, you know, 17 holes are great. One hole was horrible. That's the one you're going to talk about. And the same thing with stand-up. You could do 100 shows that are great. One sucked, and that's going to bother you for months. Yeah, it's like no different than what I do. Like if I get a comment, there's a million good comments, but it's that one bad one that's like, oh, like. Yeah, it gets under yeah. your skin. And, and I think it shows that you care. I mean, if, if it didn't get under your skin, I don't think you Maybe you're in the wrong career. You don't care about what you're doing. So I, I do care, and that stuff like that bothers me. Now, you, I know you talked about before how in third or fourth grade you did some stand-up, and then you had cake. I remember that was the story. Yeah. Um, <laughs> now, is that when you knew, like when you were in third or fourth grade, whichever, that being an entertainer was where you wanted to go in life? Absolutely. On the playground, I'd run out there and ask the other kids, and they'd say, oh, I'm going to be a fireman, a policeman, a doctor. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be a comedian. And be on TV. And they're like, yeah, whatever. So, 
do you have any crazy stories besides the one you already told of like doing stand up, like any weird gigs that that you had done um, throughout the years, like maybe weird like locations and clubs, and uh, there has to be something. Um, once I uh, I had to leave a club through the back because. It, I guess he was a bit of a mobster kind of guy, and he and he started heckling me, and I, you know, blew him away from the stage. And the management said he's waiting up front, so we have to escort you out the back. <laughs> oh man! So uh, <laughs> I've done other shows. Once I got mooned from the crowd towards the stage because I was again some heckler decided to try to take a run at me, and uh, you know I'm fairly good at defending myself, and I have to. There's 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 been all sorts of weird things to stand up. Were there any? Were there any like scary towns where like it's like dark out and like you know those like you know those towns that are like kind of uh, they're not they're not lit very well and you're they're kind of in the middle of nowhere. Have you ever done any shows like that? Oh God, yeah. Once we got me and a buddy got sent up to <clears throat> New Denver Northwest Ter- or New Denver Yukon, I believe it is up in the Yukon. Yeah. And it was in January, so it's pretty much dark for most of the day. And it, we get to our, our transportation, and it's literally a little uh, four-seater Buddy Holly-type aircraft. And the guy, because there was two comics, uh, three comics, he had to start dumping the survival gear out of the airplane because it weighed too much. Oh, God. And then off we go, and then he's not flying very high off the ground, like you know, like a couple thousand feet. That's it. And every now and then you'd get to a hill and he would have to <laughs> like ramp this thing up the hill and down and gee, really completely fearful. And then the next day he stayed, he had, it's so remote he had to stay for the show and then fly us back. And the next day he's flying us back and he, you know, first off he's not sure if he can take off in the, with the weather. So we finally get up and we're like, wow, why don't you just fly over the clouds? And he goes, no, no, my uh, pilot's license uh, doesn't let me do that. I'm still learning. <laughs> Jeez, this is the guy they sent us up with you could have died that day oh yeah and then he goes oh i gotta de-ice the plane and we thought there was some sort of spray chemical blast he literally had you know the the ice scrapers that you have in your car he's yeah he, he grabbed the ladder got up on the wing and started scraping it and i'm like we're gonna die we're gonna Die. You you could tell that story, I'm sure, too, stand up, and they would. That's a great story. Like that's like a frightening, like life risking in, in some ways. It is, and some of the time, you know, you, especially when you're starting out in stand up, you get sent on these tours, and you're doing, you know, you're literally driving 17 hours to get to a gig, and then you get to the gig, and it's just, you know, it's just hell, um, and it plays with your psyche. You know, it's uh, you're committed to it, and you like what you're doing, but. There are some shows that are just, you question why. You're paying your dues, though, right? That's the whole thing? Dues, yeah, yeah, exactly. Now, we're going to talk about Goku, of course, uh, here shortly, but I wanted to ask you something about that, that's been, uh, it's been on my head, in my brain for a while. Do you think that the changes in comedy nowadays versus like the 80s and 90s has made your job harder? And the reason why I ask, like, is because nowadays with like social media and people get offended at everything. So, like, when you write a joke now in the modern era, do you think it's harder because you have to think, you know, I don't want to offend this person or that person like i feel like richard pryor and guys like that wouldn't even work in this environment the, the guys like that were definitely broke barriers at at their time yeah because um, there was a time where you know comics were all you know take my wife please and then it you know the first comic that popped up and started swearing they were like whoa you can't you can't do that you know you're lenny bruce's and things like that you can't do that and sam kinison do that um, and now it's like you say with social media. When um, there, let, let me put it this way: there, there's jokes I've tried in the past that I'm glad there wasn't a camera around because afterwards I thought, well, that was a really bad idea to try that joke. <laughs> yeah, right. Somebody there with a camera, even inside a club, taping it, and you're like, and then you're labeled with that for the rest of your career. It, it was a bad decision. So I mean, you have to use your common sense, but certainly in today's environment, you got to be more sensitive to what you're saying. Because everybody has a camera on their phone now. So Absolutely. I remember 
a few years back, and, uh, and I'm, this is in no way justifying what he said or did, but um, I'm sorry, uh, Kramer from Seinfeld. Uh, That's right, the like Kramer that. thing. Uh, Michael, uh, oh, I forgot his name too. Yeah, Kramer from Seinfeld. Yeah, I remember that whole thing. It was a number of years ago where he was at the, um, the Laugh Factory, and then he started – uh, this big rant that he, I guess, he thought was funny at the time. It was just kind of an improv kind of thing, reacting to something that happened in the show. In the show, but literally everybody taped it, and it really kneecapped him badly. And uh, it, it's understandable for what came out of his mouth. But again, um, in today's society, there's cameras everywhere, and if you let me put it this way, you know, years back, you whatever, you're out drinking with your friends, and you drunk dial somebody and you're stupid and then the next day you're like hey sorry i did that no problem nowadays you put it on twitter or something it's there it's not yeah. going anywhere you can delete it but it's still kind of there any everything is so permanent and people don't forget they don't forget and you can get judged you know uh on, on one little mistake and, and you know obviously some mistakes are bigger than others others and need to be judged more that way but let's face it we all screw up yeah no i agree we're, we're and that's the thing i try to tell everybody like yeah it, we all have our moments where we lose control and we say things we don't mean or anything. Just you know, something that's just dumb. It's just everybody's dumb. So how did you how did you segue from stand up into being an actor? Like how did that whole thing happen? Um, I I always wanted to be an actor and started taking some acting classes at uh, at UBC University of British Columbia, and I stole slowly through stand up. Actually, that probably helped me more than anything else because casting agents would come to the shows. A lot of times, and would cast uh, try to cast us in commercials, and I and I started having a fairly com- uh, successful commercial run. Um, and I remember one time uh, in particular, it was uh, during the filming of uh, Jumanji. Robin Williams was in town, and uh, I was uh, doing improv with the improv team, the No Name Players at Punchlines Comedy Club, which is now uh, since closed in Vancouver. And then he started dropping by the, the club doing shows with us, like literally popping in through the back curtain and go, hey, hey, hello, can I, why don't I join the show? That's awesome. Jesus, it's, it's Robin Williams, and he's on right. stage with us. So I got to improvise with him a couple times, and which was probably still to this, to this day the highlight of my life. Because the um, first time I, I was on stage with him, uh, I was kind of nervous, I'll, I'll admit. <laughs> I don't think I had my Is best there any show, footage but the next time I kind of loosened up and really kind of went for it and... It had a really good show. Is there is there any footage of that? No, not footage. No, there there's. Uh, I have a couple of pictures of us on stage together. That's awesome. That's like that's like. Was, it, he came up to me wow. after the show, like kind of in the side in the sidelines there, and he just goes, "You're really funny." And I was like, I remember those words. Uh, you know, I, I I will never forget those words coming from him. That's I just all, I think all I said was, "Coming from you, I don't, I don't I don't know if you know how much that means." That's like you saying I have a good voice. <laughs> you have a great voice. <laughs> I'm not gonna forget that. Luckily now we have it recorded. But oh, that's awesome, dude! Like that's Robin Williams is like the king of like wacky. I've seen a little bit of your stand up. He there is there's definitely got to be a little bit of that in there because he's the king of like being out there. On I love his stand up, dude. Especially the stuff in the in the old days, like in the early '80s, was I think my favorite. I love stand up. I love character based stand up where people become other characters and. You know, it, it borderlines with improv almost, even though it's not. But uh, I like certain comics can, can run into a weird character in their day and then go on stage and talk about it and make it very funny. I would prefer to become that character and show everybody what I'm talking about instead of using, you know, colorful ex- examples and descriptions of doing it. I kind of like becoming that person. What would you, Are you a big uh, Andy Kaufman fan? Yeah, I was. I was, and prior to that, Peter Sellers was probably my my ultimate. And when you look at, I'm, I just look at his career and the different roles he played. And I'm sure he was told time and time again, it's like, well, you can't play that guy and that guy. Well, yeah, you can, and and he did, and it was magical to see him transform. If you've got talent, man. So what were your most enjoyable live action roles? Um, you know, I know you Stargate was a big deal, but I mean, is that your most enjoyable? What what live action like television or film role uh, is your personal favorite? Um, it, it might sound like a cop out kind of answer, but the, the role I'm doing right now on Beyond is, is kind of uh, 
it has got to be up there because it's it's a role that I don't usually get. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the show or not, but I play kind of a sociopath, uh, assassin type uh, fixer um, for this organization, who's very kind of low key and creepy. Um, and it's just a role I haven't gotten. Uh, I don't. I don't think ever. Uh, because usually, you know, the assassin guy is the big guy dresses in black and the man in the yellow jacket, right? Yeah. I, I played the yellow jacket on the show and, and, uh, yeah. they kind of, they described it when I first got that they, they saw me audition. They go, we wanted to go against type yet make them disturbing. And you did that in your audition. And, uh, and I got the role and I, and I just love it. I just love, uh, you know, the, uh, I mean, he, he performs these evil acts, and then he comes home, and he's got this wife and daughter at home, the dichotomy of these two lives that he somehow thinks. It's almost like a Walter White type thing, right? Like that kind of thing? Maybe not as bad, but... Yeah, but as an actor, it's it's just really cool to uh, to play. And that's in Vancouver, right? They shoot that in Vancouver. That's in Vancouver, yeah. And, and I mean, some other, other roles... One, one thing I did early on in my career, and I, and I still have all these, is you get uh, sides when you get to set, which are... For those who don't know, uh, small versions of the script uh, for what you're shooting that day, for the scenes you're shooting that day. Yeah. But the first page is basically all the information of the scenes, the scene numbers, the actors, uh, prop, uh, the director. It's all an information page, but it lists the actors that are working that day. And I decided early on in my career, I'm glad I did it. I, I kept every one of those. Yeah. So it, it's kind of like a, going back at the memory. It's memories, yeah, right? I have sides on there with me and Angelina Jolie, Salma Hayek, Brad Pitt, Morgan Freeman, um, you know, David Duchovny. Uh, just it, I can go back and look at these things, and it's it's just really cool. Um, I, I, I love going to set. I, I love this industry because no two days are alike, and I never know what's coming. I mean, I mean, even two days of recording, you know, you record a few days in a row. No two are alike. Everything's always interesting and and keeps you on your toes, and I, I love it. No, and, and it's crazy because, you know, you are you are trifecta. You did live, you did movies, which, you know, I, I assume, like, with movies and stuff, you know, if you make a mistake, you can always do a, another take. But with, with stand-up, if you're in front of an audience, you, you can't do that. <laughs> you know what I mean? You Just go with it, you know? And then you did voice acting, which, you know, that's – it's, it's not even your body anymore. It's just you, you know? But everybody I've talked to has said – to be a great voice actor, you should be a great actor. Do you agree with that? Because everybody seems to say that. You have to be. Like when you see footage sometimes when they uh, film actors in a, in, a, in a voice studio for an animated film, you see them flailing around and becoming the character and hunching over and doing whatever they need to do to physically become the character because you have to do that. I mean, I can hear the difference. You know, if I don't see the footage and Two people do a scene like that. I can tell you which one is getting into it or not. You know, it's uh, it's just more real. It, it's it's the difference between good acting and okay acting. No, and one thing I'll tell you, just my own personal you know opinion, is when it comes to like the Vancouver, specifically like the Vancouver or Canadian voice cast, when it like the whole different, there's there's tons of them, but like you know like Scott McNeil and, and yourself and Brian is that. I've always felt that you guys had this incredible talent because you'll see like Scott and, and you know you'll be doing all these different kind of voices and that's to me that's real voice acting like you've got the voices that are like naturally cool sounding voices then you've got the other people who are like actual voice actors like they can change their voice and manipulate it to play different characters and I've always found that to be the best ones and also the ones that I think are really really um What's the word? Uh, versatile. That's really the word I'm looking for. Because I, I remember, I'll give you an example. In an early Dragon Ball Z episode, uh, in the original Ocean, it's called the it's, it's called the Ocean dub, as you know, but it's the the Vancouver dub, the original DBZ dub. Yes. Um, Raditz says, "Keep your eye on the birdie." Now, in the in the Funimation dub, because those actors had come in, they were kind of new. Uh, they, you know, they were 
they weren't as experienced. This is back in the day. You know, Raditz says, keep your eye on the birdie. But in the ocean dub, he's like, keep your eye on the birdie. And I always thought that the way he would stretch those, like, lines out, it's like, okay, that's voice acting. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I don't know if I'm making sense to you here. You are, because even if you are you have to match the voice, you can still make it your own. Um, I mean, for, for Goku, you know, we're looking at – count right now with five actors that have done it uh, and if you it, 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 I, I counted it's actually believe it or not 16 including kid goku right i was gonna say 16. if you go back to uh, that and other incarnations of it uh, i mean yes the number gets even bigger but even for the prime if i can call it the primary kind of recordings yeah. the number of actors that have done it and uh it's kind of like comparing it to any role that's iconic and i and i will call goku's character iconic um yeah but whether it's you know james bond or superman or batman uh and i'm talking the live action stuff different actors have played it they've all played it differently but you hope you go there and you still get lost in their performance no matter what they're doing but because you, you have to make it your own Right. Well, we're gonna we're gonna talk about Goku now because that's I think people are here for that because this is the Dragon Ball channel. Um, but you you have a huge career. I mean, there's just so much to talk about. Uh, tons now. But I wanted to ask you about Goku. So Ian Corlett was the first adult Goku back in 1996, uh, and then he left the project. He was the first adult Goku. I'm not entirely sure why he left. Uh, maybe I'll I'll ask him eventually. Um, but then you came in uh, to Dragon Ball Z to portray Goku after Ian Corlett. Mm-hmm. Um, just to clarify, so everybody knows kind of your body of work here, uh, you came in, you did Dragon Ball Z episodes 38 to 53, um, but because those episodes were heavily censored at the time, chopped down, uh, episode 38 dubbed, which was called Collision Course, is actually Dragon Ball Z episode 50, which is the episode where Goku's ship was damaged and he's on the way to Namek and he has to fix the ship. And So I'm just clarifying that for the audience. Um, you know, you had come in. How did you hear about the role, and how did you audition? Like, was it in front of Barry Watson? Did Ian suggest you? Well, how did that whole thing happen? Uh, I, I didn't. Uh, Ian didn't suggest me, but me and Ian have a similar uh, cadence. Yeah, we often would audition uh, against one another, or uh, sometimes even have to replace one another on, on you know, things. When the other actor wasn't available, so we crossed paths a lot, and we're still friends to this day. We were just hanging out uh, in Los Angeles at uh, after day in LA, hanging out, having drinks uh, about ten days ago, and it was great to reconnect. And uh, he's still a good buddy of mine. Um, so yeah, you know, he left, and then basically, it's like anything else as an actor, uh, the audition process begins to find the next, you know, person to fill the role. And I think naturally, because I was in a similar voice range as Ian, they they thought of me. So I went in and, um, you know, laid down the audition. I knew very little about uh, Dragon Ball at the time. And, and that's kind of when it was exploding kind of in North America. It was just kind of beginning to really blow up. Syndication. Yeah. Um, so I, I knew li- very little about it. Uh, so went in, did, you know, did my, my take on it and... Um, Carl, the engineer at uh, at Ocean, um, you know, they steered me a little bit closer to where they wanted me, and I ended up getting the role. And uh, after getting it, I mean, there was an explosion. <laughs> I wasn't really prepared for the explosion of both praise and and criticism. I mean, I once got it like a death threat. I'm not kidding, a death threat. I remember you mentioned you got an email from some guy, and you reported him, right? Yeah, guy who. Uh, went a little nuts and uh, it got it got out of hand quickly um, so I, I tended to kind of ease back on the communication regard, regarding it sometimes but um it's it's funny because I couldn't even tell at first like when I was younger I couldn't tell it was because you, you you matched it Ian really well it wasn't until later that I kind of pick up on the differences no no yeah and thank you and that was the point I mean it, it, filling in a role that's already popular especially with voice they they want to match it Um you have to do that fairly often. I, I, re- I recently did a, a Steve Buscemi match for uh, Randy Boggs for a Monsters, Inc. video game. That's And awesome. I didn't even know I could do a Buscemi because I'd never tried. Um, so when I got the audition, it was like, okay, i got to study Buscemi. And it's uh, – yeah, as a voice actor, I mean, uh, I try to dissect okay, – I look at their mouths, look at how they're making sounds. And for me, Buscemi 
my take on it was he's got so many teeth inside his mouth. There's more teeth than he needs. <laughs> We're supposed to be professionals. They're pouring out of his mouth. There's a, you could take out two or three. And he wouldn't even know. <laughs> Right. So there's so many teeth, he tends to almost not open his mouth completely, right? So he almost talks like, what are you talking about? Look at my jaw. Seriously. Yeah. You know? <laughs> and, and that's what I started doing when I would do the lines, and then I ended up getting the gig. So it's a lot of times, I love hearing actors do impressions, or voice actors do impressions of really obscure people. And I'm like, oh, man, how did you, for me, it's breaking a code. You know, it's like, oh, that's what, how, that's how you do that voice. Okay. Okay, I love it. But but also you you exaggerated a little bit, right? Because you're acting, so you have to like turn it up a little bit, like the knob. You know what I mean? Like if you do an impression of one of your friends, you're gonna turn them up a, a little bit, not just do like them eating a sandwich. You're gonna make it more more comedic, right? Isn't that the whole idea? For sure, for sure. You you uh, accentuate the uh, the obvious, I guess. Now, did you work or audition with Barry Watson? Is that who you work with, or was it a different guy? Uh, I think. No, Barry was there initially. Yeah. Uh, at the very beginning, I think just to set up and okay everything, and then from there, Carl uh, Carl was just there for the records. The, the engineer who's been there forever at Ocean, he's a great guy. He's still there now. He's still there now. Okay, so he's okay. Well, that's good to know. Um, I was just wondering because I know that Barry. Like, I'll, I'll talk more about Barry shortly because I was curious because he um, th things changed in '99 when they went back. Um, I was gonna bring up what, why was Goku such a natural role for you? Like, what is it about the character of Goku that you resonated with? Because um, you had come in, you didn't know anything about Dragon Ball, but I presume that when you first took over, or you knew very little, is what you said. Uh, you started like watching some of the, maybe some of Ian's work and maybe yeah. reading up on the character. Like, is that what happened? Exactly what happened. Exactly. Um, I, and I just kind of connected. I don't know why, but naturally to the. Um, I like that the, there's an innocence to him. Um, right. I think that may have changed slightly w with the newer incarnations of the show a little bit, but. Um, that's what I really liked. There was an innocence, um, and I don't know. I can, you can almost compare him to a young Superman before he put the cape on, where he's got these powers, but there's this innocence behind his eyes, where you know the message is pure and his, and his mission is his mission statement is pure. Yet he's really affable, and he and he it's very easily to connect. It's very easy to connect to him. He's he's tough, but he's also. Um, at least it seems he's very naive too, and I think that that's I feel like a character like that's more fun to play. Like I feel like playing Goku, I, I don't know because I, I didn't do it. You did. I feel like playing Goku would be more fun than playing like Clark Kent. I feel like because you he's just so like naive to things, you know, and so curious about the world as a kid and as a grown up. And there were and there were at points in the show where he was kind of goofy too, and I like that as well. Where you know, um, younger kids could watch it and not get distracted by too much of the violence if you want to call it i know that it was a uh, cartoonish kind of violence because it was the nature of the show but i think it kept it kind of palatable to uh to a larger audience by doing that yeah i mean that's the thing about that era uh compared to now is now anime fans want the most accurate the most you know it has to be as close to the japanese as possible um back then the companies never cared about that it was just let's get it on tv for syndication which you gotta understand i know you know this but we got listeners now that have no idea what syndication even is you know some of the younger folks you know we have to just cut out every little and saban was meticulous with this back then when you were working on the show any sort of blood was erased over and it was super like you know, almost overly centered in, in a way. You know, nowadays I feel like, you know, it, it's kind of a double-edged sword in that you had more freedom back then to kind of take some liberties without worrying about the anime fandom coming down on you with pitchforks. Whereas now, though, it's like you could at least say more, you know, adult things. You could do an anime and, and straight up curse, and it's normal now. Back then you couldn't get that anywhere close to ever coming out, except for, you know, some rare, like, DVDs, um, well, laser discs, I would say, and, and VHSs. So, um, all right, so what many Dragon Ball fans have praised 
for your work specifically is on the original three DBZ movies. That's the ones that get the most love. The, that's the, the, the Calamus special, right? Dead Zone, the world's strongest tree of might. Many have said these are the three best English dubs in Dragon Ball history, and it's hard to argue. Like, there have been some great dubs, like Kai had a good dub, um, Resurrection F dub was, I thought, phenomenal. Um, but those three dubs, in an era where all we had was hyper-censored, next dimension, you know, stuff where you couldn't say kill or death or die, those came out and they were so refreshing. They were produced totally different from the TV show. The script was way more accurate to the Japanese. They kept the original Japanese score. They kept Chala Head Chala, no Rock the Dragon. It was still Funimation, but there wasn't Saban censoring it. I was going to ask you about what was different about producing those movies versus the TV show. Was Barry Watson, like, not there? Or was it, like, a totally different engineer? Like, how did you get away with making such a different version of the show versus the TV version? I don't think Barry was there for those. Uh, again, I think it was Carl. And, it, and at the time, you don't realize that you're doing anything that, that in the future may be special. I mean, they, they said, yeah, we're doing these movies. And it, it's like, oh, okay, well, instead of this many episodes, these, these are going to be these three movies. And you're like, oh, okay, that's what we're going to do. And um, you just kind of go in and, and, and do it. But I, all the things that you mentioned about keeping the original scores and all that, I, th th that's what made it special and cool and kind of more fun than, than the, the regular episodes to work on because, I don't know, it, it had an air of uh, importance to it that, you know, when it's a movie – it's more important, so you you tend to. I don't know if you tr want to do a better job. You always want to do a good job, but you you take extra care, a little bit of extra time on it. So, so it was a conscious decision then to to kind of like you said work on it just differently because I feel like maybe what they were thinking, and I, I wasn't there, but I'm guessing they were thinking, okay, these are probably never going to be on television. They're just going to be for the home market, and because they're just going to be for the home market, we can do it more like a regular sort of you know, uh, translation or dub versus having to hyper censor everything for syndication. I feel like they kind of knew like, all right, with these, let's ease up because they're, they're totally different. They feel different. Like when I, and I'm going to be honest with you, when I watch those three movies, cause I still watch them from time to time dubbed with you in them. I, I'm like, why couldn't the whole show be like this? It was perfect. It was like incredible the way they, they treat them with such care. I, I totally agree with you. I, I think the whole series should have been treated that way, and 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 uh, I just like the way they did them as well. They're they're my favorites as well. I mean, um, and I know a lot of fans, like you said, and I appreciate the fact that they they bring it up as often as they do that these movies are a lot of people's favorites uh, in the series, and um, I mean they're mine as well. I I, uh, I just really like them, like for all the reasons you just brought up. It it just felt kind of more pure much more um much closer to the to the real deal so to speak and i was actually going to ask you about specifically specifically like your performance because people have said that you sound a lot like masako nozawa in some of those films specifically world's strongest where you know you 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 break out of the ice and you're screaming at the top of your lungs and and that's a that's a very impressive scene because you didn't take any breaths you literally went no. Ah, like straight through, and then also when you're watching those movies, you're hearing, you're hearing, you you know, the the voice actors like yourself specifically saying Kyo Ken and not Ko Ken. So it's like you're doing the TV version and you're saying Ko Ken, which is incorrect. But in the in the movie, you're saying Kyo Ken, which is the correct way to say it. And in the TV version, you're saying Icarus the Dragon. In the movie, you're saying Higher Dragon. So I guess whoever scripted those had to be a different guy. It had to be because it, it's just, it's, it's almost like a different philosophy. Did they tell you like it's Kyo Ken this time, not Kyo Ken? Or was that something that you just picked up on your own? Like, did you watch Nozawa for that? I watched a little bit of Nozawa after I started the role, but in specifically for those, uh, See, I'm trying to remember back, but we were. Yeah, it, it, it's been like 20 years, so. <laughs> no, we were directed to uh, to pronounce those things that way. So there was a there was so, a conscious effort to uh, I, I make it more like the original. I don't know what their uh, intent was, but you know, I, I think the result was really cool. 
Somebody knew what they were doing. So you did not you did not pattern your voice after Nozawa. It just happened to come out that way in the movie. It just happened to be, come out that way in the movie. No, I didn't try to reproduce the yell. Although uh, a lot of times they would play the originals. On on, on certain episodes, they would hear the, the track first and we would get to understand what was happening. And uh, When we used to record back then, we would do, because there was so much screaming and yelling and fighting, uh, we would record our dialogue first for the whole script and then go back and do the screaming and all that because your voice would be blown out by the end. Right. You'd be tired by the time you get to the regular dialogue. Yeah. So they got the dialogue first and then uh, th- there were many instances where I came out of that studio, you know, four or six hours later, especially when we would do multiple episodes in a day, um, really sore. I mean, I, I will always appreciate those three movies because, like, I, and I'm not the only one who says this. That's what got a lot of folks into like discovering more of the series. You got to hear the Japanese music, and you know, it was just, it was refreshing. Now, the original DBZ dub ended with episode 53 um, dub numbers. There were no new dub episodes for about two years. I was going to ask you about this. What was going on at the time from your perspective? Like, did they call you and say, "Hey, Peter, we're." Cutting this off for now, but we'll be back later. Like, how did you just go in one day and they said this is the last episode, or how did that happen? What happened there? Uh, we were just told, oh, they're packing up the show and moving it to Texas. That's it. No explanation, no nothing. It was just show's gone. That's that's it. That's crazy. And and because was there any discussion about bringing you guys back? For, okay, so for those who don't know, I'm just going to clarify. What happened was in what happened was when the show blew up on Cartoon Network. Cartoon Network told Funimation we want more episodes, and that's when they had told you guys, okay, we're we're coming, we're moving to Texas. Was there any discussion about bringing you guys in, like um, to do it, or it was just you came in one day and it was already a decision, a decision that was made? We didn't come in. It was just like you know we had uh, up to episode fifty three, like you say, <clears throat> and after that we were waiting to see if we're going to do more. And they're like, no, they just packed up the show, moved it to Texas, and they're recasting. And we're like, yeah, I guess that's it. Uh, you know. We were never asked to do any more. The, the only time I've ever heard of an actor going back and doing it again was recently with Brian Drummond with um, with the black uh, character, right? Um, the, the copy of Vegeta. It, 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 yeah, the copy of Vegeta. That's, that's yeah, the only Vegeta time I've, I've ever heard it. And uh, I mean, that, that's come up a lot in my Twitter feed too. People saying, you know, we wish Calamus would have done Goku Black. And, uh, I would have loved to, but, you know, I wasn't asked. So... Glad that Brian did awesome. because he a he's a great guy and a great performer and I think the fans obviously got a great kick out of it so it would have been a neat throwback I think you know uh, it it would have been fun. No, I I agree with that. So um, Funimation brings the dub in house. They didn't want a contract with Ocean Studios. A lot of it was to cut costs. That was discussed with Sabbath, actually. I talked to him about that right. in, in a previous interview that we did. Because um, I guess the idea was flying to Vancouver. I guess that it was expensive because it's international flights. And, you know, they wanted to bring it in-house. Um, so you would think that the Funimation dub would have been it. But, no, things get more complicated, okay? So in Canada... The Frieza saga aired with the in-house dub, but then <laughs> Dragon Ball Z episode 123 in Canada, the Ocean Dub group, including yourself, came back and did the exclusive Canadian dub. Yeah. Like, oh, I gotta ask you about this because this is such a weird story. So it's weird. the Canadians kind of got jerked around. So what exactly happened? Like, there was already a Funimation dub. They started airing in Canada, and somebody said, "No, no, 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 stop." We got to bring back the the original cast. Yeah, it, it was kind of, that was it. The agent calls up and he goes, "Oh, remember that Dragon Ball Z show?" And I'm like, "Yeah." He goes, well, they're bringing it back. I'm like, "Oh," and they'd like you to to do Goku again. I was like, "Oh, okay." Um, and that was it again. I I accepted the role, went back and did a number of episodes. Um, and they. Uh, I remember when we were recording those, they were bouncing all over the place. There was no cohesiveness to doing episode number this and then the subsequent one. We were all over the map, um, and we'd do multiple episodes in a day. It was, it was just very confusing. You really just relied on the script in front of you. It was very fast, quick. Um, uh, so, so we did what we did, and then, and then they went away again. 
Well, I was going to ask you, what do you what do you think the purpose was of them? And I'm not saying it's a bad thing. I'm just curious. Why? What was the purpose of them giving Canada, you know, it, its own sort of dub versus just using the Funimation dub? And here's where, where things get even more strange. The dub that you performed, you guys actually used the exact same scripts that Funimation was using. I told Brian Drummond that he didn't even know. The exact same scripts were used for the new ocean dub i guess you can say did somebody just like mail them all to vancouver like there's so many holes in this story that i'm so curious about i'm hoping that you have some kind of light on this i don't have any light at all that we just showed up and it was like these are the scripts and we're like uh, okay okay um and something to remember even when we first did all our first round of dragon ball z records we couldn't even watch it in canada you know it wasn't even airing there so really okay so it didn't air till later it didn't air till later no so we we unless you really made an avid effort and it was very difficult at the time to just you couldn't just jump online and get all these episodes uh, it was really difficult to follow uh, a lot of what you're saying because we didn't really know what was going what was happening and they when you get booked on a, on a show like this they kind of they don't tell you much they just kind of say show up and here's the script and um, having done the character before, you you kind of know what you're heading into performance-wise, but you get very little of the behind-the-scenes info. Yeah, I mean the, that new Ocean dub or whatever. It was so strange because they had they were rehashing music from Mega Man. They were literally recycling music from the Mega Man TV show, I know. Um, which Ian did work on too. Hmm. He. What you say? Uh, no, I believe. I, I don't think I don't think Ian did that one. I think that was me, I thought, and then I thought Ian was Doctor Wiley. Oh, okay, he did, but he I didn't do Goku. No, 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 no. I'm talking about a uh, Mega Man. He did uh, the, the Ian worked. Ian Corlett worked on the Mega Man show. They recycled the music for Dragon Ball Z, like in in the the new Ocean dub. Yeah, That's weird. Yeah, I know. It uh, things get very confusing. Yeah, no, I'm confused because basically the way it was is. If you were in Canada, you got all Ocean until Goku arrives on Namek and elbows Raccoon. Then you got the Funimation cast, you know, Sabbath, Shemmel, those guys, until episode 123, which is the episode where Goku meets Trunks. That was the episode that you came back to. So what, what kind of makes me salty, Peter, man, is that the climax of the Frieza saga, Goku versus Frieza, you never got to dub it. And that's like the pivotal Goku moment. And we never saw you do it or heard you do it. We never saw Brian act Vegeta's first death. We never saw you do Super Saiyan. And that still bugs me to this day that they skipped that really important stuff, you know? Uh, I agree. I agree. You had no argument here. It would have been cool to do. Um, but like you say, if you put all this stuff on a chart, there'd, there'd be a lot of arrows pointing backwards and forwards as to, as to where these recordings happened and when they happened. That it, uh, It's been a strange kind of uh, chronology. No, it, it's weird because it's, I, I just wish they would have, I, I wish that what they would have done is they would have actually had you go back and do the Frieza arc too. Because I've got, like, I got my hands on these. I, I have seen, and they're, they're hard to find, but I have seen the android cell stuff that you had done um you know and i was happy to hear you do that like i was happy to hear brian scott mcneil as piccolo yeah like, it was so awesome to hear to hear that again but then during the cell saga you left what happened what's the story they uh, once again they i believe at that time if i remember that they had left again um and i just was given the choice of waiting around or just moving on to other things. Uh, and they left again. Okay. And when they, by the time they did come back, um, that is, I believe, when Kirby Morrow took over. Okay, then there's a lot of misinformation out there, sir, because the story that's been going around is that you left in the middle of Cell to pursue other projects. That's BS. You're telling me that you, oh. it wasn't that you left, it's that they stopped? Yes, they did. That, that, I've heard that story too, and that's, that's not true. That's not true. Wow. Okay. So that see that I'm so happy you said that because I've had a lot of my friends say, 
You know, nothing nothing against Kirby Morrow, because he's he did pretty good as Goku, but he did not sound like you or Ian did. That was the only thing. But he, I think his performance is fine. But a lot of people were like, man, like we wish Peter would have done the Boo arc. Like there was so much, you know, the chemistry with you and, and Brian. And obviously you probably weren't going to be in studio together, but still, like, you know, the Majin Vegeta fight and all these things that, you know, man, like we were like, why did Peter leave? Did he get sick of Dragon Ball? Did somebody else come along and offer him more money? But you're saying, no, you would have been down to the whole thing but they are the ones who freaking stopped yeah yeah it was a lot of stop go with them at, at that time especially on that series of records and we never really knew it was happening so did you ever get did you ever get called to come back and do the the, the ocean dub of kai which does exist it's just that it's uh, did you ever get called for that no i've never been ever since that, that last record you know ending on i guess it was episode 174 i'm just looking on wikipedia myself to get the numbers correct but uh, past that, I, I, you know, I've never gotten a call about it. Um, none of the records in Texas, they, uh, they, they, you know, they just move on to a new cast and, and that's it. That, like, again, like I said, I, I yeah. just find glad that Brian, you know, did the, um, did the thing he did just recently and kind of, you know, kind of created the whole throwback kind of feel because uh, I think, it, you know, fans deserve it. I think it was a really cool treat and I'm glad they did. I mean, I'm hoping that, and this is just me being a fan here, I'm hoping that for the uh, the Tournament of Power coming up soon, that they will cast some old school Ocean Dub people to come back. Like, maybe have Scott come back and do a voice. Even if it's, like, for one episode, I would just love it if there was a big hodgepodge of, you know, different voices of different time periods. Even some Harmony Gold, you know, Dragon Ball voice. That would be great at, for me as a fan to kind of see them all come together. You know, they do stuff like that. Like, they cast... Chris Ayers' brother Greg Ayers as Frost, the Universe 6 Frieza, just because it's as a little wink-wink to the audience. You know, I like when they do things like that. Do you remember what the last recording you did was for, for Goku? Do you do you have any memory of that? I know it was a long time ago. I, I don't, unfortunately. Uh, it, like I said, even at the time, we would go in and do multiple episodes, and they were all over the place. So I, I can't tell you exactly what my last episode or last record was. Do you have any favorite Goku scenes um, throughout your entire career? Wow. Um, like you were saying, it, the recording of the movies was memorable because of, of the nature of what they were. It was kind of a we, – we put in a little extra time uh, making those special, and I'm glad that they uh, you know, were received as well as they were. But as far as one moment goes, I don't um, – I don't know. Yeah, it, It's almost – Beyond the records themselves, and, and I hate to be comparing it to you know the upcoming convention, but the response that I've gotten at conventions has been really cool, uh, especially uh, when I go to conventions even recently. That people come up, some of them you know are literally in tears, saying how important the role was to their childhood, and that means a lot to me. Goku is is important. I mean, definitely you. You know, you were the predecessor. You know, really, you you kind of yourself and Ian too. I mean, I'm not gonna take anything away from him. And even I'll go even so far as say Barbara Goodson playing Kid Goku in, in Harmony Gold. You know, you paved the way and you put food on the plate for people to eat. You know, because um, that show. You know, people always misconstrue it. That show blew up with the ocean dub let's not change history here with all due respect to the that the new dub the texas dub it was the ocean dub in funimation um i'm sorry in syndication and on cartoon network that aired first if that didn't hook people then there would have never been a season three you would have just well, i mean there may have been but it would have probably been like a more lower budget maybe a home video only release but because the show blew up and did so well in the ratings i did a whole video on it. i did a whole history of tsunami video on it that's what allowed a lot of these texas voice actors to even come in and i think that's a, an important thing like you kind of put food on the plate for them to eat you know and i think that everyone should be appreciative of that no i appreciate that and it, it's funny you mentioned earlier about that uh funimation says they moved the show because of cost I, I, I don't know how much less cost they could have been uh, paying out recording in Vancouver at that time because this is without trying to make this sound like a complaint. We were paid extremely little for the show because at the time the Canadian unions were literally paying you by a uh, number of words, not reactions, words. You mean literally how many words your character says? Many words you said. So 
now I don't have to tell you how much fighting there is in, in the earlier Dragon Ball Z episodes. You know, it, yeah. it, and let's just say a 22 minute show, um, maybe eight minutes of dialogue, if that, and the rest is fighting. We were only paid for the words. All the screaming and all that was considered free and extra. That's ridiculous. See that nowadays you get paid hourly. You know, it, well, you get for, paid for hourly dumping. or by episode, and it's changed. But at that time, that's how bad the structure was. Like you say, it's since been corrected. But at the time, so when you say that they left because of cost, I really don't know how they could have recorded it for any less. And it's it's not like you know five executives were flying up for every episode. You just patch in, and you hear them over the speaker. So. I, I don't buy that argument at all. That doesn't make any sense to me. They, they they took the show down to Texas for some reason. I'm sure it was financial in some way, but I, it, it certainly didn't have to do with paying the performers. No, I, I don't even know if it has to do with with paying the performers. I, I just know that the talk was that the, like what I it was in the, it's in the Sabbath interview I did where he talked about how it was mostly. Barry Watson flying to Vancouver, but I'm in the same boat as you. I'm like, well, did he really have to fly that much? See, I don't know. See, because I've we've tried to reach out to Barry, and he's he doesn't respond back. So I don't know if he wants anything to do with this anymore. Um, so there's a lot of unanswered questions here because I'm in the same boat as you. I'm like, I mean, you know, it couldn't have been that difficult, at least to you know have done voices and just maybe just have stuff mailed like i don't know it just seems a little weird to me plus the internet was getting big around that time so you could have emailed scripts you know there's different things you could have done right i mean it wasn't like you Absolutely. had to fly everything back and forth no it's not like you're putting it yeah, on a truck wagon and waiting for two weeks it's like the, 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 there were ways to do it and um I, I, like i say i don't i don't know the reason why but uh, you know companies buy and sell things all the time and they move things and Unfortunately, that's what happened with this. I mean, I'm no, I say unfortunately I from our perspective because we would have preferred to keep doing the show where we were doing it. But um, well, me too. Yeah, no, no disrespect to the current cast. It's just that it would have been more consistent to have heard you guys do the entire series start to finish. Exactly. Yeah. Right. I wanted to ask you real quick about. Well, you were off of Dragon Ball Z from '99 and on, but until the uh, on Cartoon Network. But it wasn't the last time you were on Cartoon Network. You came back for Ed, Ed, and Eddie. Now I know that you auditioned for all three characters. I was going to ask you what that experience was like, and I wanted to also ask you what are the big differences between dubbing anime and dubbing an American cartoon. Um. Well, I won't even compare it to, say, an American cartoon, but I'd say dubbing uh, compared to prelay. I, I, is that your question? Well, yeah, I didn't mean to say American, like, from America. I meant, like, a Western. Yeah, like, you're, you're dubbing something that already exists in a different country versus something that's manufactured here, or at least, you know, not here in the U.S., but, I mean, in the West, if that makes sense. Sure. I prelay, guess prelay is the right word. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Um, prelay, it takes a while to get used to, and some actors can't do it at all because especially with a Japanese anime you're you're trying to match vo uh, lip flaps on the character yeah and a lot of times they will have a scripted line and you can do it you know 30 times and they finally realize they go that's not gonna work no matter what you're doing so they'll cut a line here cut a line there and when you record you know how they do it is there's a series of three beeps that happen prior to you spewing out the line and then you fire out the line after the third beep so they uh, you know, they punch you in for the line. Uh, yep, so I've it can be three beeps, a long yep. process because if you can say the line, the engineer can move the line left and right and try to fit it into the flaps. But if it doesn't look good, you got to do it again. You got to do it faster, slower, extend one word, make one word faster. It, it's You get better at it as you go, but it, it's definitely a skill. But it's, it's time consuming. Um, the prelays, where you do the voices prior to the animation, well, that's a lot easier because then the animators draw the... Uh, they got to match you. Yeah, to, in accordance to the audio, which is, again, you don't have to worry about how long a line is uh, for the most part. And that's a lot more fun. Would you would you say that Ed, Ed, and Eddie, as far as animation goes, is probably like your second biggest like thing behind Goku? Because I feel like you probably get asked about Goku more than anything, but would that be like the second one? Absolutely. I mean, we ran that for... 
if you count the movies and stuff, uh, nine or ten years. So uh, yeah, absolutely. I love that character. I mean, Rolf was to this day is one of my favorite characters. But probably the most fun. It was the most fun recording because when we did Dragon Ball, you were in the studio alone. Nobody else was in there, and you do all your lines. Yeah. Whereas with Ed and Eddie, the whole cast was in the room. So we wasted really? a lot of time just laughing our asses off to you know, the performances of our fellow actors. You know, there's times we had to stop because we were just killing ourselves laughing. So it's a lot more fun being in the room with the other actors and interacting in real time. Yeah, because that's how that's how the Japanese dub of DBZ and Dragon Ball is. They're all together in one room, whereas here, yeah. you know, like you said, you might go in and do seven episodes, and then the next day, like Scott McNeil might do the exact same episodes. You're not even there. You're somewhere else, and he might come in and do his lines for the same episode, so you don't even get to play off each other. Yeah, and it's almost impossible to do if you're dubbing, because again, with the voice flaps, one line could take 20 minutes, uh, so it would take forever to do if there if it was an entire room full of people it just doesn't work um whereas again the prelay you're the whole cast is there and it, it, the spontaneity is there and the timing is there um uh, all those things are there uh and you just can't control that in a dub situation now you're coming to command con fans coming to the event will get to meet you and get their stuff signed so make sure you bring your rock the dragon sets and your original three movies out there and you can meet peter uh he will uh, talk to ever i'm sure you'll be talking to so many people about this whole thing um what projects are you working on now that you wanted to plug you mentioned beyond uh what else did you want to plug to everyone to check out that you're working on currently uh, as far as animation goes, uh, I'm uh, part of a show called Dragon Prince that's going to be, I think it's going to be released later this year. Um, and another show that's just in, kind of in its infancy um, uh, that, again, I can't talk about yet. Extremely funny. I, I'm really looking forward to it. Hopefully by Command Con I can talk about it a little bit more. Um, Beyond is where we just aired our, our sixth episode last night um, on Freeform, so we're waiting to see uh, if we get a season three. Hopefully we will. And uh, I just finished a movie in December. Uh, it's going to be a, it's a Christmas movie that will be out next year. <clears throat> and um, just auditioning for a couple other movie projects right now. But primarily right now, the biggest or the most exciting thing for me is beyond um, possibly having a season three. And uh, I know by the convention... Uh, we would know if that happens and uh, you know fingers crossed that it does fantastic I certainly certainly more work the better so thank you for being on sir it means so much to me that I get to talk to you finally legit like it's weird because like I watched those movies when I was oh, how old was I like 13 and it was ah, it's been 20 years pretty much almost to the day and it's such a pleasure to finally get to speak to you uh, as somebody who I respect not just as a voice actor but as an entertainer overall you know television uh, and movies and stand up which I think like I said stand up to me is like the scariest thing but you managed to make it work is there anything you want to plug as far as like any social media any you know Instagram or any place that anybody can come find you and interact with you your website whatever the floor is yours yeah, my website was just revamped uh, last year. It's uh, peterkalamis.com, so please visit. Um, for uh, you know, for fans who can't make it out and have something signed, there, there is merchandise there. If, say, you know, you're farther out and can't make it to the convention, that's available to you. But at, 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 And in Twitter, it's at Peter Kalamis, again, at Twitter. Uh, please follow me there. I, I'm fairly active on that, probably more than anything else. Um, and as far as the convention goes, uh, you were saying for people to bring their stuff to get signed, please do. Look forward to meeting everybody. And I, I get bugged a lot by other actors like Paul McGillian and guys like this because I travel with – I know some actors just show up with photos. Um, I, <laughs> I kind of stalk things throughout the year and I, I'm kind of a traveling store. Like I travel with a lot of stuff. Um, so I have – Goku figures, posters, uh, patches, uh, you name it, I travel with a lot of stuff. So uh, 
knowing that this this convention was coming up, and I've been kind of stocking up for a while, so I'm kind of excited with the with some of the stuff I'm bringing. So if you show up and you don't have stuff. I'll, I'll have stuff there, and, and whether you buy something or not, just please come by and say hi. Yes, show, show a lot of love to Peter because I know damn well I'm happy to have him here because, you know, having uh, – I, I just feel like it's going to be a big bonding moment because we're going to get – for for all the fans, we're going to have people from all different ages and different dubs. Like it's very, it's very rare to get a, a, a con that has like so many different dubs. I mean they're, they're out there, don't get me wrong, but – for yeah. a Dragon Ball con to actually do that, it's uh, it's awesome. Like you know, two Vegetas, you know, one of the original Gokus. I'm well, more than two, but we can't talk about that yet. But anyways, uh, you know, I'm just very excited. Yeah, no, I am very very excited as well. And uh, like I say, literally, I'm counting down the days, and I uh, I can't wait to get there. All right, well, thank you very much, sir, for being here, and uh, check out. Peter's website, his Twitter, and thanks everybody for listening. We will talk to y'all soon. If you haven't got your KameaCon tickets, KameaCon.com, there should be some left. Come meet Peter. I'm sure we'll do panels, and uh, we'll have a good time. It'll be a good time. We'll have, there's a lot more to discuss when we get there. We'll have a fun time. So thank I look you, forward to it. Thanks for the interview, man. Nice talking to you.